We're going to talk about that today. How we don't have to be able to do anything spiritually significant. In fact, we're unable to do anything spiritually significant. The Holy Spirit of God does that in us and through us. But that all we have to do is to be willing. So let me pray for you as we get started. And we're going to have some fun this morning. Father, thank you for the time that we have today. And I pray that you would meet with us right where we are. And I know that there's some people here, some friends in this service and joining online who need this message from your word, who may be stuck. They may relate to a part or all of what we're going to be talking about. And I have just been praying, Father, and in praying, that you would just move that needle in their lives, that they would say yes to you, whatever arguments that they've been making in their head, that they would come to the end, that we would say today, Father, that we in fact are willing to do whatever it is that you want us to do and acknowledge the fact that even though we're not able, you are. So teach us that today in Jesus' name, amen. Week number five in the, uh, the story, the series on the feeding of the 5,000. Now, I don't want to call it feeding of the 5,000 anymore. I've decided we're going to call it the feeding of the 25,000 because there were 5,000 men, but probably another 20,000 women and children. And um, I think Jesus loved, I know Jesus loved women and children just like he did men. And so back in the day, they only counted the men, the head of households, and that's the way they did it. It was cultural. In our culture, it's a little different. And since the feeding of the 5,000 there is something that I think we can take a little bit of liberty with. I just want to say the feeding of the 20 to 25,000 because Jesus loved people. And we know that at this point in Jesus' life, to remind you of where we are in this miracle, mentioned in all four of the gospels, that Jesus had lost a very close friend, John the Baptist, who had been beheaded after being imprisoned. And essentially he was the victim of a parlor game, of a bet of um, some just messed up stuff. And Jesus heard about his death, about John the Baptist's death, and needed some time alone. And so he slipped away with his disciples to the other side of a lake to try to take a little R&R &R to connect with God the Father. And the crowds kept coming. So the Bible tells us that Jesus looked at the crowds with compassion, that he was moved in his heart, in his gut, and that as he was moved in his gut, he chose to engage and that he spent the entire day among the people with the disciples, teaching and meeting their needs. At the end of the day, he knew they were hungry. Now, that probably wasn't any supernatural knowledge because at the end of the day, everybody gets hungry. It was dinner time. Maybe he even heard the crowd talking about that, but he was moved with compassion yet again and decided he was going to feed the people. So he looked at Philip, one of his disciples, and he said, how are we going to feed the people? And Philip looked at his resources, took out his wallet, checked his bank balance on his app, looked at all his resources, maybe asked his friends how much you got. Everything he had and everything that he could put his hands on wasn't enough to meet the need. Some people have more than others, but none of us have enough to meet the spiritual need. All of us are responsible for giving everything we have to God, but yet it's not enough to do anything truly supernatural. And so Philip looked at Jesus and he said, we can't, I don't, I don't have it. I don't have any idea what we're gonna do. So Jesus said, okay, guys, walk out through the crowd and see what you can find. And so Andrew walked out into the crowd and he found a little boy who had some loaves and some fish, just a few stale crackers and a few sardines brought him back to Jesus and Jesus looked at Andrew and Andrew said, I don't know what you're gonna do with so little, but this is what I got. And Jesus said, bring them to me. And so Andrew did. And then Jesus took the crackers and the sardines and he gave thanks. Does this all sound familiar? We've been working on this week by week for five weeks. And then we see Jesus do something really unusual. 
Now, I think if I were Jesus, I'd want to be efficient. I would want to make sure I get the job done. I would have a to-do list and I would be ready to have some, it's good that I'm not Jesus, right? I don't think like Jesus. I want to think like Jesus, but I don't. And he's not in just the efficiency business. He's not in just the getting things done business. He's in the business of making sure that we are learning while he's doing and he's teaching and that all of us are changing. And so he chooses to use his disciples. And he says to them, now we are going to feed the crowd. Now, this is what happens. You can read this with me in Matthew 14. Bring the boy here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. And every single one of them were fed. Why do you think he gave them to the disciples? Why wouldn't he have just given them straight to the people? Because for some reason, God chooses to use us. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why am I here? Have you ever wondered, what's the reason that I'm here on this earth? Why am I alive today? Does God really have a purpose for me? If you don't wonder those things, I guess congratulations because your life is probably a whole lot easier. But some of us, we get preoccupied with these sorts of questions. And we wonder, why am I here? And I wonder that, that if I was in the efficiency business, if I just wanted to have a to-do list, if I wanted to get from A to Z, at the moment in time you became a Christian and decided to follow Jesus, if I were wanting to be efficient, I would just take you immediately and just straight to heaven. You become a believer, straight to heaven. You become a believer, straight to heaven. And it seems like it would be so much easier and so much quicker. Why would he leave us here? Why are we still here? Why are we waiting? And the Bible says that Jesus isn't waiting because he's just irresponsible or bored, that he's waiting for a purpose because he doesn't want anybody to perish, to die without knowing who he is. And so the logical conclusion is the reason you and I are here is so that Jesus can use us to do the things that he would do if he were still here to be a part of his redemptive plan. And so that leaves me with the question, what is my responsibility? What's my role? And then I get a little overwhelmed because if I'm super honest, I say, I'm not really able to do this God stuff. And Jesus reminded his disciples like he reminds you and I, you don't have to be able. You just have to be willing. But the question is, are you willing? Because with willing comes, it's scary. With willing becomes a little, oh, it seems out of control. With willing to do whatever God wants us to do, it literally means that we're telling God, your plan's more important than mine. And I'm going to follow wherever you lead. And I'm not going to get ahead of you because it's impossible to be a disciple, to follow somebody if you're moving faster than they are. And so today I want to, to ask you the question, even though, or especially since we're not really able to do anything supernaturally significant, even though we give all of our resources and abilities to the Lord, still unable to accomplish these kinds of miracles, these things, are we willing? For the disciples, perhaps it was a little scary. He gave them each a little piece, I suppose, of, of this meal broken up and put into a basket and sent them out into the crowd, 25,000 people arranged in 50s and 100s. And every time they reach into the basket to hand out food to somebody, they have to reach back into the basket and trust that God's going to put that food there. And so the disciples, as they worked through the crowd, were learning something very important about God, about God's will, about God's compassion and care for people. And for who knows how long, perhaps hours, they were involved in something so much bigger than they were and reminded that even though they were unable, all they had to be was willing. 
So I wanted to really illustrate this point. And I had a whole lot of scripture uh, and different ideas and studied things for weeks uh, and totally changed my mind on Tuesday because I wanted something that I think would, would land well for you and would be an illustration straight from scripture that you and I, that we could relate to. And sometimes the easiest stories to relate to are the stories that are the most clear. And I wanna take you to a story that's super clear and super easy to relate to. And then we're gonna come back and illustrate this point together. And I'm gonna ask you, are you willing to step out in faith and to do whatever it is that God may be asking you to do? Now you might be wondering what kinds of things these are. Maybe it's the first step of faith. Maybe you have considered stepping out and becoming a follower of Jesus, giving your life to Christ, and you haven't yet done that. You are unable to save yourself, but if you're willing to receive the free gift of eternal life by God's grace, just by offering our faith, then you can become a believer and a follower just like Jesus. Maybe it's a spiritual decision that you have been putting off, like being baptized, like we saw a couple weeks ago taking that public profession, that step of faith. Maybe there's something in your life that you shouldn't be doing, that you've been doing that is crippling you and you've been doing it for so long or so consistently that you don't really know who you'd be if you stopped. Maybe it's something you know you need to start doing. You can't imagine how you're going to get there or how it's going to happen, but you know that it's right. Maybe it's a relationship that you need to go back and make right. Maybe it's a person in your life who you need to take responsibility for and begin to nudge. Maybe it's a generosity that we've been withholding from the Lord because we're not sure if we become generous with our resources, if we'll be able to take care of ourselves. And Jesus continues to take us back to the spot, are you willing? Well, the story that I want us to talk about briefly is the story of a person everyone's heard of, Moses, the prince of Egypt. And Moses was transported into Egypt uh, down a river supernaturally. We don't have time to talk about all of that. And um, he was raised in Pharaoh's household. He was raised with all the best education and one of the most or the, the, the um, most successful, prosperous, bustling, uh, wealthiest cities in the entire world at the time, nations in the entire world at the time, had every privilege that anybody could ever experience or know. And about the time he was 40 years old, Moses made a huge mistake. He saw something that he thought God wanted to do. That wasn't the mistake. The children of Israel were being, well, they were being tortured essentially because they were all slaves in Egypt and the Egyptians were trying to crush them as a people. And Moses saw them and he wanted to do something, but his problem was that he decided that he was both willing to do something and he was able to do something. And so what did he do? He saw an Egyptian beating an Israelite and he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. And because he both chose to act on his own ability, even though his desire was probably one that God had put there in the first place. The Bible says, and this is my paraphrase, that he ran and 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 that finally, when he was exhausted, spiritually exhausted, physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted, he sat down at a well and he waited to see what was next. Well, what was next for him was he was introduced into a family that he was going to become part of and a job that he never thought that he was going to have. And the person who was the prince of Egypt had become a Bedouin shepherd with a scruffy herd of sheep in the middle of nowhere. And for 40 years, we have no clue, no inkling that he ever heard from God. Can you imagine 40 years in the desert? Well, at first, maybe you expect God to look you up, right? I know you have abilities and gifts, Moses. I know you're somebody who can really make a difference, Moses. I know you're somebody who I really need to put in my army, Moses. 
And for 40 years, God allowed Moses to get to the end of himself and realize that at one point he felt like he had a lot to contribute, but in reality, all we have to give is ourselves. Well, he went from a point when he was both willing and able to where he was unwilling and unable. And I wanna talk about that real quick. And you may know the story, but I want you to think about this, personalize this, because I think we all can certainly relate. Now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, to the middle of nowhere. Literally, it's to the middle of nowhere's nowhere, to the backside of nowhere. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses said, look, a burning bush, like any of us would do. It was a very dry, arid region. Things would burn if lightning struck. When things burned, they burned up quickly. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why this bush doesn't burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Now, a couple of things here are interesting. In the Hebrew, the word when here means exactly at the same time. When Moses decided he was going to deviate from his normal life, to shift his attention from the sheep and his job, to go over and allow himself to investigate something different or unusual, when Moses was willing to put a comma or a pause in his life, God spoke to him. But friends, Moses didn't really wanna hear from the Lord by this point. And the angel of the Lord spoke and called out from within the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and Moses answered in the most succinct economy of words, casual sort of way. Speaking, you got him. Moses, yep, nothing more. Not who dis, nothing. Just speaking, cautious, a little bit reserved perhaps a little freaked out, maybe wondering what happens next, but it's an unusual beginning to an exchange. Well, let's keep moving. God says, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, this is a good reminder that God is giving Moses. And... Um, it may escape you if you aren't tracking. These are three people who we consider fathers, founders of the Jewish faith, our heritage, great men with obedient lives. But do you know that each of these men were deeply flawed and that at some point in their life had profoundly disappointed God? I mean, Abraham, we've studied Abraham together. Abraham, I mean, he was kind of a scoundrel on two occasions, lying about his relationship with his wife because he'd rather give her to somebody else than to maybe have any kind of repercussions on him. I mean, give me a break. I mean, you look, I look at this list of people. I mean, Jacob, Jacob had some nicknames that he earned and they weren't really nice. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out. Now see the difference here. 40 years earlier, Moses had seen. This time, God said, I have seen. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I am concerned about their suffering. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, Moses misunderstood. He thought God was saying to him again, you go and you deliver. And he had a little deja vu, a little flashback. And in a sense, and this is again, Rick speculating, 
Moses was like, I know you were there last time, and I know I was there last time, and if you remember, it didn't go real well last time, and I'm not the same person I even used to be last time, and I had a pretty big failure last time, and it cost me 40 years of my life last time, and you got to pick a different guy. I'm neither able or even willing. Moses misunderstood. What God was saying to Moses is, I'm asking you to do something, not negotiating. I'm asking you to do something. And I need to know if you're willing. But the thing is, I'm not asking you to deliver the people. I'm just asking you to go and be my instrument to Pharaoh. I'm going to deliver the people this time. You see how it works, Moses. You go, I do. You go, I show up. You go, I do all the heavy lifting. You be obedient. Watch what happens. And Moses scratches his head. And you and I might think, well, great. Sure, we'll go. Why wouldn't we? But Moses has arguments. And so do you and I. He looked at at God. Now, these are my paraphrase. This is a paraphrase of the arguments. They're in your notes on your app. If you want to read this, if not, you can read these in Exodus 3 and Exodus 4. But Moses gives a couple arguments and you and I have the same kinds of thoughts. He said, you know, the people back there, they know me and they know my failures and my mistakes. And I'm not 100% sure I'm the right guy to go back because they're going to question me just because they know who I am or who I was. Have you ever had that thought? when God has nudged you to do something, to step out and to encourage, to lead, to reconcile, to forgive, to ask forgiveness, to tell somebody you love them, to start with those concentric circles that are closest to us and we think, wait a second, they know me, so they're not gonna believe me. I get that. And again, a paraphrase of exactly what I believe God said to Moses is, they're going to believe you exactly because they know who you used to be. And then he said, they aren't going to believe that I've actually met with you, God. They're going to think I'm making stuff up because he was the kind of guy that 40 years ago could have gotten by on his wit and his skills. And God said, you tell them that you have met with I am. Yahweh, the personal expression of God in the Old Testament, that you have met with me. And then he gave him some prophetic details. Now, even in this exchange, Moses is like, I I don't think I'm the right guy. I can't do it. And God said, look, Moses, you have a staff in your hand. Throw down the staff. And uh, Moses threw down the staff. You know what happened? It became a snake. And Moses ran from the snake. Can you imagine visualizing this? Or be, I mean, I don't like snakes. I've seen a ton of them. I grew up in South Florida, lived in the South. Snakes everywhere. I don't like them. Uh, I, I believe in the curse, right? My heel, their head, a shovel's better. A shotgun's even better than that. If you throw a staff down and it becomes a serpent, I'm gonna run and squeal and try to get away. And that's what Moses did. Hiked up his man skirt and took off. And God said, no, pick it up. And Moses is like, are you kidding me, God? And God said, pick it up. And Moses, maybe this is the easy way out. If I grab this snake by the tail, I'll be dead. Discussion over. So he grabs it by the tail and the tail, the the serpent becomes a staff again. But that wasn't enough for old Moses and it may not be enough for you and me. God says, take your hand and put it in your your cloak. So he puts it in his cloak and he pulls it out and it's white with leprosy. A terminal disease. And God said, put it back in your cloak, which he did and he pulled it out and it was perfectly normal like before. So you think that would be enough for old Moses, right? It wasn't. And God's patience was running thin, but it didn't run out. And Moses said to God, and this may be the one that you and I relate to the most, 
I don't have the skills to do what you're asking me to do, God. I am slow of speech and I don't think very well on my feet. And God told Moses, don't you remember that I'm the one who chooses to give speech or to make someone mute? I'm the one that gives sight. I will put the words in your mouth and the thoughts in your head. I am able if you are willing. I can't tell you how many times as a preacher I have relied on that passage of scripture. I will put the words in your mouth and the thoughts in your head because I am God. All you have to be is willing. I am able. So every excuse, they aren't going to believe I know you. They know who I used to be. These were the people who saw me at my worst and my failures. They're going to make fun of me. They're going to, and then I, I don't have the ability and God hears them all. He responds to them all. And he says, I get it. He even decided he was going to send him Aaron, which ended up being a really bad situation. But Moses demanded a concession. And then at the very end, he throws his hands up. And I love this. I have it in bold in your notes. He throws his hands up and he says, God, with all due respect, pick somebody else. And then I don't know what happens because there's a silence in scripture. And it's not very long in the Bible, but there's a silence there. And I want to know. The next thing you see, he goes to his father-in-law, good old Jethro, who played a huge part in this story. I'm a father-in-law and it encouraged me because Jethro was so profoundly important in this story, but yet mentioned so little. Moses goes to Jethro and he's got, hey, I need a little leave of absence. I'm going to leave the scruffy sheep with you and you're going to have to walk them back and forth on the backside of nowhere. And Jethro said, and Moses didn't even give him the detail of why he was going least not recorded in scripture. Jethro said, go ahead. You should go. I know he knew what was up. And I believe he sent Moses with a smile on his face and a thank you to God in his heart. And then dot, 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 Moses shows up in Egypt. Well, I want to ask you, right now, are you willing to do whatever it is that God may have you do? If you feel a nudge in your spirit, if you know there's a next step to take, if there's something you've been saying no to the Lord in, within or about, are you willing? You don't have to be able, just willing. We're going to sing a couple songs and then I'm going to come back and Pastor Dan and I are going to pray for you because I know that many of us are at that spot and you may need a little help. Father, thank you for my friends, and I pray that we're almost finished, but let's take a look at Moses one more time and kind of wrap this up to make sure we're all on the same page. This is an important week. It's the, the week where we choose to do what it is that we've been learning and, and that we know. So we go all the way back to Moses, and we go all the way back to Moses and his experience with the burning bush. Now, many of us wish that God would put a bush in our life and set it on fire, right? Because then absolutely, it's clearly the Lord. Sometimes the way God speaks to us is a little bit more subtle, which is why I enjoy learning from examples that are extremely clear. And so we go all the way back here and we look at Exodus chapter three, verse four. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, then God spoke. And Moses said, here I am. Now that's sort of what I've asked you to do today. Here I am, ready to listen. And then the next step, willing to act. Don't come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And I like this image because Moses was dirty. He'd been out <laughs> hanging out in the dust and following sheep around, sleeping on the ground a wrinkled, sun-beaten old man who desperately needed to shower. And he wore sandals and didn't have socks. And God calls him close and Moses comes close and God says, take off your sandals because the place where you're standing is holy ground. Now, holy, sanctified, set apart. He wanted Moses' sandals off so that there was nothing in between God and Moses at all, not even a thin piece of leather. 
It was as if God was telling Moses to draw a perimeter or a circle around his life just for a period of time, just for a moment where the past wasn't relevant, where he wasn't preoccupied with the concerns of the day or projecting into the concerns of tomorrow or the future and just said, Moses, be with me right now, right here. Turn aside and listen to me. Now, one of the hardest things that we have to do when we say we're willing is to take God at his word. And one of the things that we do here every single Sunday is we talk about God's word and the promises that he gives, the instructions that he offers in the way that we live that's different. But Moses had to decide the same thing that you and I have to decide. Is God trustworthy? And if I'm willing, will I go? So perhaps God's created a perimeter around your life this morning, either here or watching online. A little circle in the sand. He's given you a moment to push away yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's drawing you close, whispering in your ear, asking you this question, are you willing? Let's go back to the disciples for a second. I can relate. One said no. One said, probably not, but here, I'll give you what I got. Just a little kid. And then Jesus said, we are going to feed the crowd. And the disciples are like, what do you mean we? And they have to step out in faith. And as they step out in faith, God did not let them down. Now, project to the end of the day. You're hungry, you're tired, you're cranky. Your plans have been frustrated. You want to spend some alone time with Jesus and people got in your way. Then you saw this huge miracle. It was a lot to, to digest for a group of people like you and me, just men and women hanging out, just normal people. After they had fed every single person who was there, they collected how many baskets? 12. We'll talk about this next week and the week after. Little lunch baskets and went back and sat down and the disciples had a little dinner themselves. Wasn't it cool that God didn't forget them? That their needs didn't go unmet as they were meeting everyone else's needs. That they couldn't outgive God. They couldn't outserve the Lord. And I just sort of project I think about the conversation they may have had after Jesus maybe slipped away and they're processing together. This guy's crazy because a lot of times they thought he was crazy. I mean, not crazy like unhinged, but crazy like asking us to do things that don't make any sense. And they're like, yeah, but he's good. Can you believe what just happened? And then I think they may have looked at each other. And this is kind of what I think. I think they said, you know, this was crazy, but it was fun. And these are the kinds of conversations or those are the kinds of conversations that I want us to have as a church family every single week. Can you believe what God has done in lives, in our community, in our world? Can you believe what he's allowed us to be part of? Wasn't that crazy? But man, it was so much fun. I'm gonna come back next week and we're gonna do it again. I'm gonna follow Jesus tomorrow and be willing and watch him do it again. And friends, you will see your change. The people closest to you will be changed. Your sphere of influence and your concentric circles will change, not because you're able, because God is, but because you're willing. But God will only use you in proportion to the amount you are willing to offer him. And you can settle for a superficial version of faith that God never intended in the first place. But we're not going to do that. Father, as we close today.